Well, hello everyone, and we are thrilled that you could join Automation Hour with us today, November 5th. Um, Paul, if you want to flip to the next slide, please. We'll go through some logistics here real quick. So we have all of the lines muted. However, we do invite you to post your questions either in the Salesforce Automation Hour Trailblazer community or in the question widget here in GoToMeeting. Uh, we'll be monitoring that throughout the broadcast and Paul will be taking questions live uh, as time permits. Uh, we will record this and post it after the session, so be sure to keep an eye out for that post and it'll be on our YouTube channel. As always, we invite you to uh, follow our Trailblazer community group, Salesforce Automation Hour, and also uh, check our website for upcoming events. We're also on social media on Twitter with uh, Automation Hour as our handle, so we invite you to follow us there. And let's see, next slide, we've got some sessions upcoming. So wrapping at the end of the year, we've got about four more, a lot of great content from both the uh, MVP community, uh, Salesforce employees and others. So we invite you to uh, attend those sessions. Who's Michael Barnes? Looks like we typoed that date, didn't we? Michael will actually be here <laughs> with us next week. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, we've got uh, the 12th and 19th and then a couple in December here. All right, so we also want to make sure we say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, Active Campaign is one of them, uh, without whom we could not bring this to you. Our other sponsor is Concrete.io. Uh, I think that might be the next slide here. Sorry, there's a good five second delay from my slides to updating. Gotcha. Yep. So again, Concrete IO has sponsored us since the beginning, and it's thanks to them that we can bring these webinars to you all at no cost, uh, which we definitely like to do. Um, as always, we want to say thank you to our co-founders, uh, David, Jennifer, and Rakesh. Um, we've had a little bit of a change in recent times, so your current co-hosts are uh, Rakesh Gupta and myself, Michelle Hansen. And we are pleased to introduce today um, Paul McCollum. <laughs> who is going to take it from here. So Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, sorry, apparently I was supposed to read the template before inserting it in there. I didn't do that, <laughs> my fault. All right, can you still hear me okay? Hopefully my microphone hasn't uh, died again. Yep, you sound great. Thank you. All right, so hey, thanks for everybody for joining. That's 150 people, wow, big audience. Uh, hoping to go over today a, a very flow first pattern uh, that should allow you to use flows for processing uh, large record sets. Um, this is something that kind of came together as an idea off of uh, uh, answers.salesforce.com and a long thread of people uh, trying to figure out when they were hitting the wall with uh, issues with processing records and trying to get around it so that they could process uh, large records or large, large memory space, came up with a solution. Uh, I have I keep sharing it, it's not really my idea, it was a group idea, um, but I put some polish to it and hopefully uh, everybody gets some uh, use out of it. It's it's empowered a couple of people so far, so happy to tell more people about it. Uh, my name is Paul McCollum. Uh, I am a UX focused CTA studying uh, user group leader. Uh, I lead the Dallas Salesforce developer group. Uh, this is some of the stuff that I've done in the past. Uh, not that big a deal. I'm always up for conversations about JavaScript, volleyball, and solar power, um, but usually spend my time trying to work on user experience issues uh, from the architect level all the way down to the application design. Uh, I'm an enterprise tech arc at Accenture currently. <laughs> Uh, and have been there, this is my second stint there, and I'm very happy to be back there. Um, that's a brief, if you wanna get a hold of me, the the uh, QR tag uh, takes you to my UXaholic uh, Twitter handle, and that's the best way to interact and reach out. All right, so as we start, <laughs> warning. Uh, we are about to talk about uh, something fairly sensitive, uh, or at least we're going to unleash some kind of programmer apex code capabilities into Salesforce. And so we need to be very aware uh, that you have the ability when you're doing this to create an infinite loop. Uh, Salesforce's flows have been very specifically designed to keep people from doing this. Um, this is an advanced pattern that is going to empower you, but you need to be careful. 
so at the very end, we'll talk about some of the ways to be extra, extra safe, uh, but you need to grok the pattern thoroughly before you start to implement it and make sure you know what you're doing because uh, you can get yourself into trouble. Um, if anybody has any problems with it or you break your org, please, you don't know me. All right, so that out of the way. One of the things, the uh, the problem that we're dealing with is, or at least to state the solution, the summary of what's going on is we, for our flows, we get records, we loop over those records, and we try to do stuff with those records or do stuff with that data, or manipulate it. And if you try and do too much with the flow, you run into these really fun governor limits. And let's see if my animations play. So you can run into CPU time, iteration count, and memory size issues. Uh, so a lot of people that are trying to solve this problem of trying to get flows to work or trying to be an enterprise solution, uh, a lot of times flows seems like it's a record at a time solution because of the, the limits you bump into really quick on uh, governor limits. So you hit processing and complexity limits inside of flows quickly. So they almost seem more like a hobby platform than a pro platform. This trick, uh, this pattern will hopefully help fix that and be one of the things that uh, Salesforce leans into to try and expand it. But um, if you are hitting a CPU time limit, your flow is just running for too long. You're hitting objects that have triggers. Those triggers are doing things. Uh, you can run into a CPU time limit. Uh, one of the things people try to solve when they're uh, troubleshooting this error limit is they want to try and pause the loop so that you take stop the loop from processing and therefore Salesforce stops counting it against the minutes or seconds that a process is running and doesn't shut it down because it's run too long. Unfortunately, pause carries with it a save methodology that if you're dealing with a lot of data and you're pausing in between steps, when you pause, uh, Salesforce pushes this into memory for resumption later. And if that, if you're dealing with something big that runs out of time, you're probably too big for pause to be able to save and get you out of there. So uh, trying to switch to pause, usually just um, different dogs, same fleas. Uh, flows have a maximum of 2000 iterations before they air out. And so we'll be talking about what iterations are uh, as kind of our primary limit as we try and shape our flows to be able to use this pattern uh, to run for large sets. And then memory size, when you, you can only have so much data in a safe state, trying to go to a subflow doesn't usually fix it. Uh, subflows usually will also, I think, still run into the iteration pattern. Uh, subflows work for some uh, governor limit issues and some they don't. Um, but this, uh, this event pattern uh, gets rid of all of those. Uh, you still have to work within them, um, but it, you don't run into them as vigorously as you can with the uh, normal patterns. And let me go back to that uh, and want to be very clear that something that starts our flow and our flow loops and does work stays within a single transaction. And you're trying to keep or any of the other things that spawn out can also be considered part of a transaction. That is a group of events or processing units uh, that Salesforce tracks to make sure that they're they're not runaway processes and will kill them off so before they get uh, before they run too long or take up too much of your system resources and affect you or other people in your tenant. So that is the main kind of constraint that we're working within and that this uh, recursive flow event turnstile pattern will hopefully get us out of and, and help us work with and around. Now, there, I'm hoping there are probably two different types of people in the roughly 200 people that are on the call and watching this. Um, you've either hit this problem before and you're ready for me to just tell you what the cheat code is, or you're learning flows, you didn't know that there was a limit um, and you don't wanna be slowed down by it whenever you do hit it. Uh, I'm gonna show the cheat code first as a big summary of the, the solution, and then I'm gonna go through all the steps that go for it. So. Uh, it may not ex match your exact use case. If you've got an additional use case, save that uh, for the end and we can uh, talk through how to do it. Uh, the use case I'm gonna talk through here is uh, kind of a scheduled, I need to create a case for every account in my org once a month. And so once a month, I'm gonna poll all 10,000 of my accounts and create a case for each of those. So our basic flow is monthly, I have a scheduled 
flow that runs on the first day of the month. It's going to go out. Oops, that advanced. I can't click while I'm presenting. It's going to go out and get records. Hopefully, you can see my cursor. Uh, nope, I probably can't over there. It's going to go out and get records. We're going to loop over those records, all of my 10,000 cases or 10,000 accounts. We're going to build up a case object that we want to create all these cases in one fell swoop and one collection, and then we insert or update uh, the records. That's our work, what we want to do, your purpose. So these are the basic steps you go through. Something triggers us, we go out and get all of the affected records that we're wanting to work on. We loop, multiple loop, different loops, lots of assignments. We build up some kind of activity, and then we, we you know, bulkifying is our best practice. And then we execute that by storing the records, updating the records. If we've done a calculation, um, we're pushing that and then we're finished. We don't do anything else. Um, and all of this is taking place in one transaction. So that's the basic pattern. So what we're doing to cheat is that we are using a magic event. So an event, we use a, a flow, a flow that does one thing. It listens for that thing that starts us. So if it's starting on the 12, you know, at midnight of the first of the month, that flow is gonna generate an event. An event triggered flow runs its own process. It's gonna do the exact same thing of get records, loop over records. We're gonna start tracking how many records we think we can get through in a single flow run. Uh, you know, the maximum would be 2000, that's 2000 iterations uh, inside of a flow. And then it would process that record we're going to add the extra step of tagging the records that we've already done, basically writing back to our original account record saying, uh, you've already processed these, don't process them again. And then if we, if we hit the max that we're looping over, we're going to create another event. That event is going to trip the flow to run again. It's going to go get the records that you didn't just tag in the previous run. It processes over the next set of records does what you're trying to do. If it hits the maximum, it assumes there's more records to process, creates another event and starts over until you make it all the way through your loop, at which point you're finished. So underneath the, the limit of 2000 records, 2000 at a time, 500 at a time, 300 at a time, you're going to process the records, write down which ones, write back to the record which ones you processed, and then emit another event. Each time you emit an event, you're ending the transaction. Each event triggered flow starts a new transaction. So you are only responsible for tuning your flow to where it can run fully with a set of records, and then you can bite size it down into smaller and smaller bytes until it fits within transaction limits. So that's the shortcut. I expect to see a bunch of people drop off because that's all they needed to know. And that is the secret sauce of this pattern is that you are bite-sizing your flows and using events to turnstile whenever each, when you hit a limit and reprocess and run through and you're just turning through your records and doing it. There's no magic setting or magic switch. You are just making use of event to process out. Uh, so that's the shortcut. Um, like I said, if you've got particular patterns that don't fit the account and want to ask them, we'll ask them again. But now I'm going to go through the pieces that you, uh, the engineering you have to do to get your flows to fit in fit within this pattern for everybody else. So these are the developer concepts we'll be going over. You'll be shaping your record sizes so that your flow will be able to process them. This This means that you have to understand the amount of records in your production org that you'll be using and size them into uh, groups that you can process within your flow limits. You have to create a mechanism on your calling object. And there's a lot of things you can do way to do this. I'm doing this kind of a brute force way in this example to save your progress so that you can resume so that when one flow finishes and it starts the next flow the next flow can pick up where the last one uh, left off and then creating and using a platform event to trigger the flows uh, that's my favorite and it's the easiest and we'll get to that last the first two are a little bit harder one is uh, some math so um, prepare to uh, get your caffeine coffee because uh, this is the dull part 
So what the limits we're working with then, and we kind of went over, flows have an iteration limit of 2,000 iterations. That's the most, uh, once we size the record count, when we can bite size the records down to small bits, the one we really care about is how many steps are in the flow before we hit an, an error in the flow. And iterations are special events. Most of the time, uh, SOCL, assignment, let me put my cursor on the right screen. So SOCL, assignments, assignments, and SOCL. So this flow has a total of, I, and sometimes I don't think decisions count. Uh, I'm not a thousand percent positive on that, but I, for the sake of this purpose, everything inside of the loop, we're gonna count as an iteration. And so we've got three looping iterations. Sorry, help me go for, size your data. Hey, I had an extra side slide that helped uh, talk about this. <laughs> Sorry. Go. So we'll be going, each time I update this presentation, it gets worse and worse. So I'm sorry, guys, you're getting the, the rough one. Uh, we'll be pulling records that we got to make sure that we stay under the 50K record limit for Git queries, then under the 2K iterations, and then under the 2K divided by element loops iterations. So I'd already started, I jumped ahead of myself and started talking about that. Um, this is where we're talking about these iterations here in this once per flow, they run once for each time that the flow is count, is is run. And the stuff after the loop also once per flow. Uh, depending on how many records we have, this runs three times however many records we have. So if we're going uh, doing a thousand records, then we have 3,000 iterations here plus three which is 3,003, which is more than 2,000, which means if that's how we ran the flow, that that would fail. Um, so let's start talking about how to slice that into it. So if you design your flow for one or a couple records at a time, you get all your logic worked out, all the work that you're doing before you start pushing it against data, you've got your basic logic built out. I now know that I've got three loop actions and three one-time actions. So if I've got to stay under a count of 2,000 total actions, I need to subtract three from that. So I start out subtracting three from 2,000, and then whatever's left, I've got to divide by the number of in logic here and say that that's my number. So uh, I'm not gonna do the math every time, but I'll go through some examples. If we have uh, two loop actions, and no other non-loop actions, which you wouldn't have, you'd do a thousand records per flow. Five loop actions would be 2000 divided by five, that's 400 records per flow. So the more actions go on inside your loop, your available at, the available records that you can process starts to decrease rapidly. Uh, so the full on example, if we were taking two loop actions and 10 single actions, we could only do 990 records per flow. So that's this first step or second step of sizing is trying to figure out uh, how many actions you have available for you on the inner loop and how many the flow can run total. So hopefully that makes sense. That this is the, uh, the equation you're going through. If you've got 10 loop actions and 10 single run actions, you could only do 90 records per flow, per flow run. All right, next concept, counting, saving, and resuming. So as you run through, if we're bite-sizing up the number of records that we're gonna process, so my, my 5,000, 10,000 accounts, if I'm doing a small loop like the one I was doing before, I can do uh, 990 uh, records per, per flow run. So I would need to break this up. I would need to tell my flow to Every time you get to 990 or thereabouts, stop. And if you hit that number, uh, save your work, mark all the records you've already pro uh, processed, and then emit an event, and then you'll pick up at the next batch. So it runs faster if you can process it in the flow, but if you can't get all the way through it, you emit an event and you start again. So we want to, as we're going through this loop, and let me go back here, when we're running through this loop, one of our assignment steps is how many times have I gone through this loop? I've decided that I can do 990 records. So I've got to create a variable, a constant variable, um, 
and check against that. Am I on loop one? Am I on loop two? And every time you go through the loop, you add one to your loop counter. So you're comparing a loop counter to your limit. And once you hit the limit, you need to break out. And so we're counting how many, how many loops we've gone through and how many loops we until we stop. And then that's where we fork our decision. I see my camera going on and off, sorry about that. And so that we're watching that count. And either way, if you hit the maximum or you don't, you need to save your progress so that you don't come back and run it again. And that means updating, I update my accounts. I have a last process date on my account and I write that every time the loop runs, I set it to today's date. And anything that has any date different from that, I pick up in the next loop. So simple to create a constant inside of the flow. Here I've got 500, I've given myself room to grow in case I need to add one or two more steps inside my flow in the future. I just pick a nice round number below 990 and I'm gonna do 500 accounts at a time. I create an extra field on my account called flow code key. It's a text field and I'm storing uh, a date in there that I build by a formula and I compare it um, and I select any records that don't have the date of the current run that I'm doing. I would do one for this month and next month. I wouldn't care about the stuff last month. I'd ignore everything except for today's run. All right, so the fun part and the part that maybe scares everybody if you hadn't had a chance to work with them, these are super easy. Um, they're created in a slightly different format. You create event, events inside of the platform events inside of setup and you're basically creating an object that you can create records for. Um, so here I've created two fields and two relationships on my flow turnstile object. And this is the object I'm using for any of my processes. I'm putting an event out there. I'm giving it a flow code and a date key. And that's what triggers my flow. That's what I read. And that's what I recreate if I don't get all the way through all of my records on each run of my flow. And when you're creating those, uh, you follow a pretty familiar process. This is what it looks like inside of a flow to create a flow turnstile event record. And this is what a normal account is. They're identical. So Salesforce made flows event creation look just like record creation uh, inside of the flow interface. So super easy to create flows and use them this way um, as part of your flow process. There's really no difference. The only difference comes in uh, is when you're trying to troubleshoot and assemble the part. So um, I'll go over that a little bit later. So assembling the full part. So something is starting our flow. Um, it kicks off an event. This is this section here. The next parts are all of the work that we do, the extra work we do. And I had a nice highlighted version of this. Um, the additional work we do is build a tag and create a um, collection and we start counting our max loops. We update our records for taggings. We update our records for whatever else we're doing, send emails, whatever we're doing iteratively over a large record set. We do all of that work. And the only variation is we test at the end whether we came out of the loop uh, at the max breakpoint or if we got all the way through the loop and we're done. If we hit the max breakpoint, we write another event and we start the process all over again. So this is what it kind of looks like. This is what our original flow looked like, was it doing work. Now we break it instead of this being triggered by a schedule or a record triggered flow, the initiator of our process, all it does is create an event. So what normally would trigger our flow to run triggers an event to be created and our event waits for an event to be created. And then at the last step, it recursively can call itself by creating another event of the exact same time that it triggered to run on previously. So at the end of every flow, it's basically telling the flow to start over and run some more. If you've marked your records correctly, it will pick up where the last flow left off and cycle all the way through all, your, uh, all of your records. So again, this part starts the process, 
the second part, this is where all of your work is taking place. And then the last part is where you're prepping for the next run. You're marking your progress. If you're up here on this path where all the loop has run, all the, the flow has finished the loop, then you're marking them all as done and there shouldn't be any others. And the step that's missing here is since I got through all the records, I don't need to create another event and the flow process dies. If you do, it creates another event and restarts. So sorry for hammering that home, but that is the whole key to this pattern. All right, let me walk through the demo for flow, or at least walk walk through my slide or my my org. So while you're working on getting that set up, we had a couple of questions come in. So first question. What is the likelihood of an admin for a medium-sized customer hitting the 2,000 iteration limit? Um, if you are trying to, so flows have kind of been relegated to trigger or workflow-based single unit activities. This one thing happened, I'm gonna go do some stuff, check some other places and do one thing. Um, Admins, I think, get tasked with report type or, hey, every month, can you send an email to every account or every case that's open in this status? And if you're, if you're in an org that has any objects with more than a couple thousand records and anything that's important, um, you could hit this a lot. Um, and I think this, is, this has been a, a stumbling block for a lot of admins uh, trying to use flows because they need to use it for something large and not, uh, and they can't just, okay, whenever this record gets created, then I update this field to say Tuesday and, and not Wednesday, as opposed to uh, when this one gets approved, everything that uh, points to it or has the same attribute also gets updated. And if that's more than 10,000 records or if it's more than 2,000 records, you're stuck and you need to go Apex or you find some other hack to do it. All right, let me, I'm still hopefully, let's see, sharing the screen. Can we see my trailhead? Yes. Great, okay, cool, and I can see my preview. All right, let me go over to setup. Let's go over to flows. And excellent, we are almost done with everything and it's 2.30, plenty of time for questions. All right, so let's go look at my big and complicated Whoa, I think, nope, that is not the right one. All right, so my schedule, my nightly create a case for all accounts scheduled flow is this whole thing right here. Uh, I start at a certain date, you can put that any time. And then I create a record. The only variables I have out here are the flow code key date. Um, I think I made it a formula because I made it text first and I didn't want to go back and make it a date field. Date field would probably have been better, but here's me converting date into text so that I have one key to go look at and I can tell my other flow that this is the date you're currently running on. And it uses what I passed to it in this original event to start processing and filtering records. There's really no other logic here. Let's see. This is just, yeah, the create. So. That is it, all right. And so triggered off of that is this flow and I'll go ahead and pop open the variables that I have out here so we can talk through those. Uh, I created a constant in here of 500 records. It's just a number. The flow code key is a formula. It's coming from today also. I think I actually don't use this. Um, and here I've got, I pull, I can adjust without editing the flow. I can use a label that's a, almost a custom config setting and I can adjust down the uh, number of runs from outside of the flow. So this is just kind of a future perfect example. Uh, everything else, I think that is the only, and then there's one other, yep, var loop counter. So I initialize a var loop counter, 
inside of the inside of the loop i'm counting the number of loops starts with zero and i'll talk about this at the end so ignore this decision for a minute i go out i get all of my account records where flow code keyed does not equal flow code key so i'm ignoring anything that i've already processed today with the same code key i get all of the records i hop into a loop i do some assignments and I add one, this is the important one, I add one to my counter, and I add one to, so I'm building up, here's where I'm saving my place. The account is storing the flow code key with the ID. Uh, I think this is debug, but all I'm storing really is the ID and the code key, and then the case details that I want for what I'm actually trying to create. I store all those individual items into one collection. So I add each individual iteration of the loop to a collection and the, the tagging or the keep track of my place variable to a collection. And then I hit this decision step. Is my target greater than or equal to my counter? If it is, that means I hit the max and I follow this out. So this step is creating all my cases from my case collection. I finished with that, so I mark all of the accounts whose so cases I just created. Those are all the pieces of the loop. We went through them together. We create, if we create a case object in the case collection, we create an account object in the account collection. We write those down. If we hit this max, that means there's more records to process. And then we create a new event with the same flow code that we came in. If we hit the finish, we do the exact same thing. This create records is creates the cases from the case collection, updates the accounts from the account collection that we've already processed, and that's it. That means it's done if it was less than my loop. And there were if there were any records left at all, we'd hit the loop, we'd come back, we'd get records, get records, we'd get one record, it'd go through the loop one time, write the records, and then it would be done. If there were a thousand left, it would go through, it hit 500, there'd be 500 left. It would hit the record and it would hit the limit. It would create a new event and it would run itself again. That is, those two just go back and forth. And actually once this one initiates it and this one will just continue to call itself, I create an event, I heard an event that I created, I run again. And so you're breaking out of the transaction. This flow runs iteratively, uh, recursively over however many records you have, as long as you are successfully populating the accounts. If I skip this step and accounts never get updated, I would select the same records all over again. I'd process them. I'd create another 500 cases. What if this is broken? I wouldn't mark the accounts and I'd keep on going. I would never get through the more than 500 records and I would do this in an infinite loop. Uh, so you do have to be watching, you do have to be careful. Um, I haven't actually run into what happens if you create an infinite loop. I assume there's some kind of monitor process that says, hey, this flow has been running way too many times. Uh, stop it, kill it, restart it, balance it, and you're in trouble. Uh, but that's that's the long and the short of the demo. Perfect. Well, the questions are flowing right in. Um, okay. Lots of people asking some things. So let me start back to it. Okay. So then let's see from Marco. Rather than locking to avoid record lock issues, the account when flagging, would we be able to pass the IDs to the next event and then remove set account IDs from the record collection? The record collection is not maintained across event triggered flows. Each time you submit an event, you're starting the flow with a completely blank memory space. Uh, you can't say, give me every record except for this one to a flow and have it respect everything that had gone on to that place. You would get, if I had a thousand and I said, hey, I just finished with this one, you'd get 999. When you went through the loop again and said, don't do this one, it wouldn't know the two previous. So you could say exclude it, 
but you'd be trying to build up a variable to pass via the event of all the records. And I don't, I haven't seen a way of excluding record, filtering out records to have a smaller set uh, based on a, you know, not in collection. You either, you, you have to use uh, the only, the only way I've seen to filter records natively is by doing conditional statements and your collection won't survive from event iteration to event iteration. Okay. So we got one from Carol. It says, thanks for showing possible ways of use of the platform events. But for your use case, um, all you need to do is not getting records after scheduled flow begins, just choose object when configuring scheduled flow. So your scheduled flow will behave like using only one record. So then you will need more than 2000 elements in your scheduled flow to hit the limit. Not sure I quite understand that question. Okay, Carol, we might help clarify that just a little bit. All right, Curtis has a couple. First, how do you solve for the tertiary transactions that might be triggered by updating the record that aren't part of this flow? Uh, that is your problem. Um, <laughs> you, know, you absolutely could have tertiary actions that that are changed to this flow. So, I mean, even if you have a one record flow, if it calls uh, an AP, if it triggers a, uh, an Apex trigger, if it updates an object that triggers Apex and that Apex runs uh, longer than your flow can handle, uh, it will time out the flow and it will break. So yeah, this doesn't do anything to save you from any of the downstream uh, effects of, uh, of timing out or any of the other limits that you could be hitting by. When I update account, if there's too many triggers on account and they take too long, or if I'm doing 500 at a time and the 500 take too long, I might have to drop it down to 50. And then you would do 50 accounts at a time and then each iteration would get that, um, you know, would get its own set of time limits on each run. It wouldn't be slave to the same, to the same transaction. So you just have to keep carving it. If you got to where it's one, you would your max loop would be one. You'd break out every time. You'd mark the one you already did. You'd select, you know, up to fifty thousand. You'd get uh, forty nine ninety nine, and then one at a, you could do this one at a time. Uh, the last time I implemented this, uh, we did one point one million records. It was almost doing something with an opportunity roll up. Uh, but it was a fairly clean org with no triggers and it went through each opportunity did some or each account added up uh, some opportunity stuff adding some other stuff that couldn't be put into a roll-up field um, and it went one opportunity at a time did a thousand lines of calculation in each run and then went to the next account so yeah no it's good question yeah it absolutely does nothing to get you out of of downstream issues that happen after the flow, but it, it only saves you from inside the flow. So a follow-up question to that, can you query limits in flow like in Apex? Can you query, no. So the uh, there may be an unofficial, somebody was telling me there might be an unofficial Salesforce uh, plugin that lets you do uh, a max, a max on Git records. And so this right here, this pattern, until we get to the advanced part, this pattern is limited by, you've got to have a query that returns under 50,000 records. That's the current max for Git records. If you don't have a good index that can get you down to 50,000 records um, or a good strategy there, you've got some more data math to do. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit when we go to the end. But yeah, there's no, you either add a condition, there's no limit, there's no, it's either only the first record or all records. There's no only give me 500. Um, so you're dealing with that one and done all the time. Okay, so Joe asked, and I, we may have sort of answered this, but let's just make sure we reiterate here. Seems like it's possible to create an infinite loop that won't be stopped by governor limits. Is that correct? And how do you detect and stop that? I did this, right? We went over this slide. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, infinite loops, absolutely possible. Um, again, I have been very careful when I've run this 
uh, and I'll I'll go all the way back down. I just wanted to punch that. I'm very I'm very topical with the, the Squid Games. I'm down with the kids. Um, so one of the advanced things you got to do on. Uh, yep, nope, that was not it. I I did not put the advanced topics in there. Slide in there. Excuse me while I fast forward through everything. Um, what you can do, where where we are tracking and where uh, where we're tracking here, we're doing a placeholder uh, event inside the accounts. I'm not trying to get to where. So this update accounts, this is marking all of the accounts that I've already done. One of the other things that I do, and you can put it up here at this decision block, is create a maximum loops counter that also decrements. If something updates your data, if something is clearing out your marker while you're working on this, then you could that could also put you um, into an infinite loop. So one of the things I've done to be sure, especially when I'm trying these out and we're not certain on the data and the size that we're grabbing, is put a, a value that we decrement and say, okay, I'm gonna run this 20 times and then when I create my new event, I pass a counter variable minus one. And so when this one picks it up, it checks to see is the counter variable greater than zero uh, or greater than one, just to be safe. If it gets all the way down to one, it doesn't run and there's no, there's no decision, there's no branch of logic happening on that. It gets here, it sees that the event that started it had a one, um, one is too low, so it stops. So you can put a lot of extra tests in there to keep from running that. Um, past that, if you create something runaway, uh, I don't know how to do that. I, I think you would have to go in into the, uh, uh, the jobs and then kill the flow as it was running uh, from the console window, from the setup console. Don't do it. I don't want to find out. I don't want to know who gets notified when when I'm playing with stuff like that. Excellent, all right. So I've tried to include some answers in chat that summarize what you said. Um, again, listen to Paul. Okay, um, yeah, let me, and I can go to debugging. Uh, if we, did we get all the questions, Michelle? Sorry. Not yet, we've got a few more. Okay, oh, okay, um, now, well, let me go through this one. This is, so the one big problem with this uh, that, is really, really hard is debugging. Um, when you run flows, when you're dealing with event triggered or plat um, platform event triggered, this flow right, oh, sorry. The left flow, the initiator flow is the one that you run. This creates an event that this flow is listening for. When you use your flow debugging, where you track and see if you're doing everything the right way, if you're getting the right values. And, you know, it's really, it's still new to me. It's only, it feels like the debug stuff has only gotten really good in the past uh, release or two. You don't get that here. You can't simulate an event being fired without firing an event. And you don't, you can't debug a flow based on an event that hasn't been, you can't, you can't execute that. You can't just go in and hit run or hit debug. Uh, it gives you uh, this lovely error. There's a problem. You can't run these. This is all the output you get from the launching the flow. So you have to um, early, and I would suggest doing this early because once you break this and once you're dealing with almost working, um, being able to reference or put in debug steps that send you a notification, hey, I got this value, hey, it was this, you have to put, it's what we used to call putting a lot of system.debug statements or alert statements in your JavaScript, uh, print line, print console. Um, you have to be ready to do that to, to debug your flow because you do not get the beautiful flow output that you used to because you cannot run the platform event triggered flow uh, by itself. The other piece on platform events, you can't go see which ones have been run. There is no system-based way, no Salesforce setup or uh, internal, uh, you know, main main interface way to see what events have been fired. You can't go do a SQL query and show me the past 300 platform events. 
they go to the platform event bus and it has there's other ways to connect to it but there's nothing built into the platform so if you're worried that an event didn't start and i've had that happen a couple of times there's a config setting let me hop back to that quickly this right here there's a checkbox that says publish immediately or wait for commit. Wait for commit is some other action that's gonna publish your event. And if you don't check this box, you don't get events when you run your, uh, your new event triggering flows. Uh, so make sure that they're always published immediately uh, when you're doing that. So yeah, oh, so here are the advanced concepts. So, um, Last pieces, so if you have more than 50,000 records, you can, just like we passed an extra counter to say only run this flow, even if I've still got records, I only wanna run this flow 30 times. I only wanna do 30 repeats. Um, I don't wanna get an infinite loop, I've got too many records, I just wanna prove that it works, and then when I really test it, it'll be late at night, so I'm gonna put that 10, 20, 30 flow run limiter uh, today, and I'm not going to update everybody's data. So in that same vein, you could also pass, if I've got 50,000 accounts, if I've got uh, 5 million accounts, 500,000 accounts, I and they're all broken up over 10 years, 20 years, I can segment my data, I can have my event pass which year created we're on, and when you get to the end of your create an, a, when you get here, when I get finished with all of the things in that year, I can say, okay, am I still within, is it less, is it, if I'm only going 10 years back, have I reached 2011? And if I haven't reached 2011, then take the year that I'm on, increment it by one, and then create the event again, and then have this get records, include the event attribute the new event attribute that we didn't create in our current one and filter records by that event attribute and if you're dealing with big tables it probably needs to be an indexed uh, parameter that you have on it date created is something that is uh, automatically indexed uh, there's a couple of other fields that are automatically indexed uh, but if not if this is something that's important to your org you can create an index that slices it up into groups of 50,000 to where you can run this and repeat over it, um, and then asking for that new parameter that that breaks your you know 50 million accounts into groups of 50,000 um, can be indexed and can be done for you. You just have to adjust your your org's data a bit. Uh, other advanced safety counters we went over that, and then the big secret behind this managing multiple flows so i started i didn't want to create a new event object every time i created a new flow that needed to run off of events um, i had five or ten and so i created an extra field and it was for this magic field here um, and i'll hop back over to my flow and so i gave this flow the key name of account update if I had another flow, the first test I would do, I'd still submit it to my flow turnstile event, but I have the first step in my account update flow is to check that the flow code that was emitted into the flow turnstile event bus or the event object was that had the name account update. If it doesn't, it doesn't do anything, and this flow doesn't, this only wakes up long enough to test and see if that's it, and then it doesn't go forward. I might have three other flows that are all listening to that same object, and the first step in their process to see, okay, something happened to that object. Is it something I'm supposed to care about? Nope, okay, then I go back to sleep. They all three wake up, they all test it. The one who it refer, refer, refers to starts processing and does the loops, and keeps inventing to the bus, they all wake up on either iteration, they see that it's not their turn, uh, not their event, and then they shut back down. Uh, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure, I am trying to figure out if I wanna build an orchestration pattern out of that for putting all of my events to the same object. Uh, I don't think that there's a big performance problem of having this flow wake up for each iteration, test, and then go back to sleep. Um, but it's something I'm still playing with. It's kind of an advanced pattern, and you can have one event object as opposed to 50 
orchestra all orchestrating the same set of you know nightly update flows or monthly uh, record check case check status check whatever you're doing in batches it's there's never really ever one flow that needs this pattern you probably have <laughs> two or three all right so that is it for the content the uh, rest of the questions oh we've got yeah. plenty of questions still to go so all right great all right from dominic uh, great topic and presentation paul have you set the maximum loop constant in a custom metadata type as opposed to directly in the flow would that be possible yes um i you can custom metadata no problem it is another sockle event um i think i i reduced the um because you would do a get records from custom metadata where i was doing it was in a label um, so I pulled a, a custom label in to tell me what the loop max is so that an administrator could size this down if for whatever reason this you needed to, it was running too long or you started getting a timeout because of future development, you could go in and start ratcheting the flows down based off of custom metadata or a record label or a custom label. And Same so the concept. Label does not require a get element the way a custom metadata would? Correct. Okay. As far as I know, uh, that, that may be some internals to flow, uh, but as far as standard knowledge, yes. Okay, next question we've got from Curtis. What design has worked to maintain knowledge of process records other than the record itself? Say, if you wanted to maintain the last modified information of an actual user for a clean audit trail, could you use custom object, custom metadata, do something other than mark the record itself, basically. Um, nothing that works any better. I've played with that a couple of different ways, like trying to create a temporary lookup table, uh, but trying to keep like, and, and you're pulling, hey, I want to look at all of these accounts. I'm going to store them in a temp object, um, but you still run into, I'd have to do an event flow to create that, and I'd still have to have some way to mark it. It's still, if it goes outside that 50,000 record or the 2,000 record limit, there's no, um, there's nothing that doesn't bring you back to the, the same problem that there's too many records for one flow uh, loop to cover. You know, moving them to a different place, uh, writing them maybe to custom metadata, and then you'd have to loop over custom metadata and try and uh, delete that in groups. Uh, every Every time I, it's the one thing I hate the most about this pattern is writing back to something big like accounts, uh, because there's probably a lot of triggers on accounts and a lot of uh, that would be where you'd be slow and writing to that could be a, a definite weak spot in this, uh, in executing to this. I have not figured out a way um, that is uh, graceful that actually works on that without hopping into code somewhere. And that's kind of the point of the whole thing is not to have to hop into code. So great call out, good good catch. It's it bothers me and I lose sleep over it. The only other way, so the the actual best way, and I haven't implemented this, now that you say it, is marking one record and having some kind of indexable value on all of the records and going and finding the. So I stamp one of the accounts and said this is if I was ordering all of the accounts by the date they were created, I would say get me all of the accounts that have a created date greater than the date of the account that has this stamp on it. And so there you you would be able to trick it and do it one per batch um, with a little extra math. But you'd have to go in, you'd have to run a filter, and you might have to run an extra query to get the date of the record that matches your, your last one and then select all of the records after that. Uh, that would be a more efficient pattern um, than updating all of the records and making sure that they track. Updating all the records puts some accountability that you know for sure all the records have been processed uh, and you have that record there that you can go kind of back validate. Uh, the more efficient code ways is the less um, less trackable and, and debuggable. But yeah, great site. Okay. So Murphy's got our next question. Was this solution developed to overcome the limit of scheduled triggered interviews that can run in a 24 hour period, which I think is, he mentions is 250,000? 
Uh, no, no, this was really what when I came up with this, whenever I started talking about this, I had built flows. I love building flows. And I always say, if you've got an apex task, if it doesn't have like these one or two things that I know only apex can do, or some variety of like heavy duty memory in memory lookup that would be just messy in a flow interface. I'm usually stepping and say, hey, no, I want to try and do it in flows first, and then we can go Apex Dev. And I solved a couple of very heavy, um, you know, logical things, had some beautifully orchestrated formulas that I was really proud of. And then it turned out that the client had more records, more accounts than they thought they did. They, you know, I originally thought I was working in a small org and they only had 700 accounts. Like, oh, no, we only have 700 accounts of that type. The thing you just built, there's 3,000 accounts. Like, oh, well, can't loop over 3,000 of anything, have to go to Apex, and I just have to throw away all of that work. And so I did that a couple of times, and then I started going hunting for, for ways to do it. There's a guy on uh, I, one, one good long thread, and somebody mentioned events, and I heard I remember hearing that events didn't um, maintain transaction, that they broke transaction processing uh, as far as what what the definition of a transaction was. It did event transactions didn't carry on uh, post and pre uh, event creation. And light went on and I started working on this pattern and have shown it to a couple of people. And it's like I said, the last one that I showed it to Eric Molly and I uh, worked on a Saturday and I think we got through like 1.1 million records um, going through account at a time. I think we we're doing 30,000 accounts and each account had um, um, 10,000 opportunities up to like 15,000 opportunities. So we had to do float. We had to do loops within loops. We did an outer counter variable. So we continued to process and add stuff up. We passed the sum to the next event. And then when we finally got through with all of the records, then we said, okay, now go write the record and go to the next event. Or we repassed the same record and we told the flow, if you get anything in here besides the word next, then use that as a, uh, go get that record and reprocess it again. So added some extra logic there. I didn't want to put that out here. It's a cool pattern, uh, but it just adds some complexity and this one can be hard enough to absorb. It's a little counterintuitive. Excellent. Okay, so Sumanth, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Sumanth, Sumanth um, question is, so each record from get records that goes into the loop is counted as one iteration and say if the get records gets more than 2000 records, then we are sure to hit the max iterations error? Sort of. So each, so you can get 50,000 records. You get 50,000 records and get records. You start your loop. The thing that counts as your iteration, this is one iteration. Going through the loop, this is one iteration. This is one iteration. We'll continue to say this is one iteration. I go back up through, I'm looping again, another. So we, we start one, two, three, four, another record, five, six, seven, another record, eight, you know, nine, 10, another record. This is where you start building up iterations that, so if I have three in-loop iterations and 2,000 is my max iterations, I basically have to divide 2,000 by three. However big my logic that's repeated for every record is inside of the loop or however many loops you have, counts against that 2000 iteration limit. And that's why you have to size it to say, if I've got three iterations, I've got to divide 2000 by three, that's about 670, we'll round down to 500 and I call 500 my breakout loop counter number. So I do them in groups of 500 and then I come back, pick up 2000 again or 50,000 again, but not 50,000 minus the 500 because I've filtered out the ones that have the flow key that says that they were already processed, and then I get 40,000, and then 39,500, then 39,000, and and so the the set that I'm pulling back because I'm excluding the stuff I've already processed gets smaller and smaller and smaller with every run of the event because I continue to tag the accounts as this has already been processed and my Git records um, ignores anything that's already been processed. So it just chips away at it loop after loop within the 2000 iteration boundary. 
Awesome. All right. I know we're over time, so if people have to drop, um, we co completely understand. But if you've got some more time, Paul, we've got several more questions. I'll keep uh, taking them. Yep. Phenomenal. We'll try and get them all answered so they're on the recording. Um, so Justin Gilmore popped in with, I'm dealing with some objects with a large number of about 200,000 records. Sorry. Um, I'm struggling to get selective queries to get a subset of records. Is there any way this could help me with that? This this will work as but you this is the uh, the larger set so if you could figure out a way to segment your data along an indexed value and you may just have to create an indexed value and go in and and force update um you know select 50,000 records set them to value 1 uh select 50,000 records or 2000 you know do some kind of mass update bulk import um, or figure out some formula value. Anything that starts with the letter A, as long as as long as you can break it up, and as long as you can pull a condition that's indexed that will that will give that to you, you can do this. But you you have to you have to hack at the data model first. You have to put that index in there. Since you 200,000 records only means you've got to divide it by four or five. Um, and if you've got the way um, uh, I did that for one friend is by year, uh, create date year, create dates indexed. Um, his uh, his accounts that he was looping over were um, over a 10 year period. We grouped, we did a Sockle query, we did a group by um, on the accounts grouped by year created. None of the individual years had more than 50,000 records. So that meant we could loop over, we start at 2021 and subtract uh, one year each time until we got to 2020. And that way we were able to get through uh, all the accounts by slicing it that way and using an indexed field. Excellent. All right, so Maria's got a couple more questions. Number one, when would you consider using a batch job or a tool like Mass Action Scheduler to start the batches rather than a platform event? Or would you? Um, so some of the there's some stuff that came out with batch size and batch actions that uh, came out around the time I was coming up for this. So if this is out of date, it's out of date by about two months or three months uh, since I've been using it and blabbering on about it. So I don't know. I don't honestly know. There's probably going to be more stuff that will uh, do what this is trying to do or facilitate what this is trying to work around. Um, but I don't, to me, I want to build, and I've been working with some Apex trigger frameworks, uh, trying to figure out if we can have an Apex trigger instead of letting flows start events and having multiple flows tied to the same object and multiple Apex triggers tied to the same object, having the Apex handler class generate an event and be the generator of event, and that triggers, Apex triggers and flows and so you'd have to everybody would have to play in the same framework um, so that's that's something i'm i'm toying with trying to get into here because the recent addition of record triggered flows and event triggered flows um, means that they start to cross over with some of the discipline that's been built around apex triggers and that's yet to be worked out i am still waiting for somebody to to deliver a uh, uh, a pattern that includes both record flows and apex fl uh, triggers uh, in the same pattern and can keep those organized. But this is the first step, routing them all through the same trigger, being able to see uh, all of these flows subscribe to one event and being able to add per, um, you know, go to one central place and see which of these 900 flows that are, were built in my org are firing when they fired. Uh, how often they run. There's no naming uh, convention control on flows. Um, you know, even Apex doesn't have very good namespace. So running everything through this turnstile organizes it a little better. And I, I think I've talked all over and around the question. <laughs> Sorry about no. that. I hope that helped. <laughs> so she followed up with, are there any platform event limits that we should be aware of? Um, I'm not aware of any. The the scale that I've been working in has been 1.1 million records and greater than 700. 
So once, so in between 2,000 and, and 1.1 million, uh, I haven't seen any. I haven't heard any licensing uh, concerns around too many platform events. As long as the platform events are consumed within Salesforce and not outside, um, you know, like this is doing, I don't think you run up against any licensing concerns. Um, if you create an infinite loop more than a couple of times, I'll bet that they come up with one. Uh, but so far, there's there's nothing that I've heard of. Platform events was made to be kind of an ephemeral bus. Uh, it only keeps data for so long, and they don't really have any guidance uh, on what the maximum is. And if you're just starting to do this, and this is the only way of using it, um, you know, you're probably not going to hit them. If you're in a very platform events, you know, you're already using it to uh, to do a bunch of other things. Then I would I would do more research than I have to to handle it. But me, this is more enabling. Uh, tiny projects to turn into medium-sized projects, and I, I haven't uh, haven't considered or run into any impacts from uh, medium to large bumping into very large. Okay, there is actually a platform events allocations page on uh, developer.salesforce.com, so I pasted that into the question answers. Um, but a quick Google for platform events limits Salesforce will provide you that page as one of the top results. Okay, next question. What user context does a platform event triggered flow run in? Um, we're guessing it's the default workflow user, so I'm assuming that's going to run in system mode. Um, it depends on how you call it. So yes, probably system mode. De definitely. So the, the thing that generates the platform event could be set uh, to run as a user mode, but once that event is handed off to the system uh, or handed off to the event bus, the uh, there's no user context attached to it whenever the flow uh, picks up and starts running based off of the event. So there's there's no transaction. There's definitely no permission handoff, no user uh, context. This user ran both of these flows, and they're both attached. I, I believe it's it's completely separated from all of the others, so it would have to be system. Possibly system on creating the event, definitely system on the run and reiterations. Excellent. All right. Marina asked a question. Is the main reason to use this rather than an Apex trigger the ease of building for non-developers, or is there a technological benefit for using Flow rather than Apex for large groups? So the difference between Flows and Apex is Flows are much cooler. Uh, no, there's absolutely no real reason to do that. It, the declarative style, uh, the advancements in Flow, more of what they do, Salesforce is moving more and more flow first. So in keeping with that, um, I ran into something I couldn't do with flows. I figured out a way to do it with flows and this is it. And it's helped a couple of people that have had a large chunk of logic built, had a large plan for how to do it, wanted to do something in a flow, but the only hiccup they ran into was number of records. So uh, yes, it is really just trying to have one fewer thing that you have to go to Apex for. Um, and able to do this solely within a, um, a uh, declarative development mindset. Perfect. Okay, so next question we've got from Michael Harbinek. What are the advantages of using this design versus some of the third-party tools like Mass Action or Dollars, the declarative lookup roll-up summary? Uh, that you don't have to use those other tools. Uh, some of those have uh, some interesting ways of getting around that in the back end. Sometimes you're not allowed to install managed package on a client or where you're at. Um, and this, this stays fully within the, the Salesforce stable and doesn't require you to uh, uh, hook up to any third party pieces. So it's just cleaner. Yeah, there's probably a, a couple dozen ways. I'm sure somebody's hit this before and tried to do it. I would just go straight to Apex, um, and that's what I've done in the uh, the times I've done that before. One of the other, when I didn't want to throw away code, um, I was using most of the same mark your place, and I would just call, I would schedule the flow to run 10 times. I'd mark my place, I'd call it the same way. The event one does it recursively, it does it end to end, but you could just call a flow 10 times, mark your place, and be done with it. So there are other simple ways, there are ways of doing it without events. Uh, this one uh, just does it really fast um, and really uh, it keeps it in one kind of context of where all your logic is 
or two, if you consider the, the calling, the triggered flow event creator. Excellent. So Marco had a suggestion. It said, just a thought, feel free to add if useful. The collection sort element can also be used to limit the number of records so that collection sort could get placed right after your get element. And that would help us simplify Ooh. the flow and get rid of the redundant create cases and update accounts element. Ooh, did not know that. Yeah, that collection sort is fairly new. I have not played with that at all yet. Um, excellent. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will go look into that and uh, yeah, that'd be great to be able to tune it and that I, a collection sort probably still isn't going to duck you under the, the, you probably, I think you still have to do the 50,000 record query um, to get something into a collection and then sort. I don't think, but I'll, I'll look that up. That sounds interesting. I didn't know that that was there. I haven't played with collection sort at all. I'll figure that out. I have a feeling it's still subject to the all or nothing and it all has to be less than 50,000 on the query, but uh, I will go look that up and see if I can do that. If we can save memory in each one of these calls, that would be fantastic. And with that, I think we finally got through all of them. There's been several glowing uh, comments. Um, this is brilliant, uh, really fantastic presentation. Definitely one that Marina will be coming back to. Mary said, uh, thank you, Gina pop, uh, popped in with this is brilliant. So uh, this is probably one of the longest automation hour and 15 minutes I've ever been on. Uh, <laughs> so Paul, we definitely thank you for presenting and, and taking the time to get all the questions answered. Um, actually, before we let you go, I just refreshed on the community and we have some content out there. So um, Mr. Bender, Mr. Peter Bender uh said he has used the pattern with platform events a number of times it can work well but it's difficult to monitor whether platform events are actually being created and what their content is which can be important in testing or troubleshooting um, theoretically workbench could be used but doesn't seem to work properly in sandboxes and peter hacked together a visual force page that streams platform events for himself have you found any other tools that work for that uh, no, um, the the other like I said, I, I that is absolutely a true statement. I'm going through my presentation because it, it debugging uh, just stinks. Um, and having all the what I would suggest once you do this one time, so notification custom notifications can be your friend in this pattern. It just pops progress on this every loop every iteration um, you, you need to narrow it down so you don't blow up your screen um, but once you get a custom notification element built and it's a pain to go get the id and and put the address in there but putting the custom notification action in between these steps to give you okay why is it exiting why isn't it creating a record why isn't it doing that putting that in there works pretty well you do also you can change the way you dev and start instead of building the whole flow and debugging it um, when you're done, uh, which works great uh, if you're debugging the flow directly, but an event-driven driven flow, uh, that won't work. So you kind of have to know you're using this pattern. Either get the main flow working and then disconnect it from uh, being a uh, an auto-launch flow and turn it into a platform event flow, or just get comfortable with doing notification uh, you know this is what this email icon means on here is inserting a custom notification in between these two steps saying tell me the value of the event for some reason i'm not getting to get records or i don't know where i'm getting and you just put these checkpoints in each one of these um, you could get fancy and put decisions hey am i still checking um, variables and then have that turn off with a custom label um, that's how we do it uh, in apex you know, I'll, turn, I'll create a a logging function and I only call the logging function when I'm debugging and otherwise I, I set the value to off so I leave the functions in there but they're just not called uh, at runtime uh, so yeah you have to you have to change your your debugging game to be able to use this gotcha so and I'm then I have not seen a third party that lets you do it comet d is the thing that you can subscribe to from external things uh, to Salesforce, but that may count as a Salesforce Connect, which may have license impacts for you. Uh, so outside consumption of events may be different uh, than internal consumption. For me, if you've got it published, just test it early and often. Hey, I created an event. 
hey, I was able to get records. Hey, I was able to get records and start a loop. Hey, I went through 300 loops and just build it iteratively as trying to trouble as opposed to trying to troubleshoot it um, in one shot in the dark. Absolutely. Uh, let's see, Peter had one other comment. Um, people should be aware that subscribers to platform events will not automatically receive events when the solution is deployed to another environment. Uh, apparently, Salesforce support helped him uh, troubleshoot that eventually. So the upshot is when you generate a sandbox or deploy your work into production, you have to disable and then re-enable any subscribers in the new environment so that platform events generated there will actually trigger to the subscribers. So that's just a helpful gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, there is a place in setup uh, to go look at. Uh, I think this is it. Yep. So you can see if you go to my event, you can see that the only subscriber to this event is this flow. And you can go directly there. So if this gets disconnected when you do your promotion, you should be able to see that I don't have a subscriber and you have to go in and edit the flow, touch the flow to get it to hook to the next platform. I have not dealt with uh, with promoting these up through production environments. Um, with people, I've I've only gotten it working, and then everybody else has has done the part of moving it up. But thank you, that's a good call out. Did not know that uh, that that broke uh, in code promotion. Perfect. All right, I think we're actually through all all the questions now. So Paul, we appreciate your time so much today. Thanks for those of you who are still hanging on here. Uh, hope all of you have a fantastic rest of your Friday and a great weekend. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Hope it helps everybody. Have a good one. All right, we'll see y'all later.